Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Tuesday chat about uh, urban growing and food security, seed security, um, and uh, general survival as it relates to being able to grow our own food. Uh, so my name is Andrea Rowe. I am with Halton Environmental Network, and we provide uh, climate change education and resources in the community of Halton. And uh, one of my favorite ways of bringing that to the people is by talking about food. And joining me today is Kevin. Can I introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Um, I am Kevin Hamilton, and I am in a very illuminated, light, sunny, kind of sunny, overcast greenhouse, and my face is very dark. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> and there was light. Um, I work at McQuestion Urban Farm uh, in Nawasa in the east end of Hamilton, and we're doing uh, two acres-ish of organic food uh, in the east end of Hamilton. Um, and yeah, I've been growing food for about 20 years organically, and I have lots of experience and knowledge. And today's topic is especially important to me because uh, I really like the thought of being off grid and sustainable and not dependent on uh, all the systems that are in place that we currently have and all the future comforts that we don't currently need um and being a farmer and being out in the fields i think about these things uh long and hard every year especially when it's uh, as hard as it is to make a living farming and uh figuring out ways to i wouldn't say cut corners but just be more efficient um with our use of hydro, water, electricity, like everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that's where in today's topic lies. And I've got lots of ideas and I'm always open to uh, learning new things and being pushed in the right directions for DIY stuff. And uh, yeah, being able to help further things that are greater than you or me, but uh, more about saving the planet and the earth and having uh, seven generations that can follow us. Absolutely. Yeah. So every week we take a new angle on this topic. And uh, so Kevin and I both, because we're outside working um, hard <laughs> to grow food, uh, we both realized that with the extreme weather that we've had in the last couple of weeks, that this might be a good angle, uh, a good um discussion point around the topic to take is climate change and how do we make our food system more resilient. So we've had crazy show uh, storms, we've had extreme heat already, and today we're under a rain advisory. So climate change, whether we want to admit it or not, it's here, it's real, it's impacting us, it's impacting the way we grow food. Uh, food availability, and it's something that we need to talk about. So, Kevin, what has impacted you the most over the last couple of weeks with the ups and downs of the weather? Um, well, I mean, so for, for me, I'm, I'm always thinking about water and I'm always thinking about temperatures. So, um, if I mulch my gardens with hay, I wish I could take you out and show them, but it's absolutely chucking right now. Um, I'm on a bit of heavier clay, so when I mulch, I really hold the moisture in. So if it gets wet, then things can go anaerobic under my soil, uh, meaning no oxygen, and things can die. And if I don't mulch, then you kind of leave yourself open to your, your soil open for um, killing all that good microbial life and all that biology uh, because it dries out a bit. So. Yeah, it's those extreme heats and then the droughts or the extreme moisture that uh, goes with it. That's my biggest concern. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, with, with a few of the, I started to think about things like shade cloth because a few years back there, I know that everything was suffering, including hot crops and friends that had greenhouses. All their crops were suffering in the greenhouses too, which we've never really seen before when we've had like weeks, uh, two weeks over 40. Um, so yeah, that's another thing. And then just the suffering that goes along with it. Uh, you know, if you don't have air conditioning, I've never had air conditioning in my life. So it's been hard for me to cool down if I don't have a basement or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, 
I actually started using air conditioning in my car, which I've never really used before, but it was a function of I need to cool down and my brain is not, <laughs> you get forgetful when it's, it's hot and you have those long days. So yeah, yeah. You get sluggish, you get lethargic. Yeah. Yeah. And the brain, absolutely brain fog from so many different reasons. Yeah. And we're, we're constantly thinking about heat and water as well, but we have a bit of a different situation because we have community gardens located in neighborhoods throughout Halton region. And because we're so dependent on summer students to do a lot of our planting and tending for us, we don't generally get started until mid to late May. And we were already having mid 30 degree temperatures before anything even gets into the gardens. And then to keep it watered was pretty difficult for those first couple of weeks. Yeah, we lost some transplants of beets, which usually when you transplant and fork uh, the way we do, you usually don't have those issues. But it was that one weekend where it was, yeah. And uh, we lost some beets, about half the plot. I was like, oh, so embarrassing for me as a farmer. But, you know, it's go time that time of year. So, yeah. yeah. So what what are the solutions? What can we do to help the situation? Um, backyard gardeners, community gardeners, small scale farmers, large scale farmers. I guess um, everyone needs solutions and uh, like, needs to be part of the conversation around what do we do to make it more sustainable going forward? How do we how do we grow our food? in these changing conditions? I, I, I've been trying to start a collective for years. Like I think we as humans, I'm just gonna throw a few ideas out there, but um, we as humans, we like to complain or we like to uh, talk about the problems. And uh, I'm always open to listening to people talk, identify the problems, and then quickly before it goes into just some diatribe and rant, what are the solutions? Because uh, we're stuck with another cons uh, with another majority government for a minority of the vote, the solution there is to have proportional representation and have every party take that as something they're going to promise in in an election campaign with very simple wording so they can't dilute it. So, and that's something that we as the people have to get together. That's a solution. I think we can all agree that uh, our voting system really is terrible. Um, moving along from that, then we're talking about the politics of. I think we need to just forget about that and we as a people have to get together and I've been trying to get a collective of people together that want to bulk purchase the things that we know we need moving forward. So one of the biggest things is, well, um, our refrigeration. If you're going to grow food for yourself and you want to mm -hmm. store it, you're going to need refrigeration. So um, there is a company called Walden Labs, W-A-L-D-E-N-L-A-B-S.com, Walden Labs. And they have, uh, you know, old technology is you have a root cellar. So you go down four feet into the ground and you make yourself some kind of <clears throat> airtight, watertight, especially um, place underground that's going to hold, that's going to be about 10 degrees Celsius and you'll get down to like four degrees ish in the winter. Um, that is a great mm -hmm. way to store this place. Walden Labs has these big circular spheres with a staircase that goes down. So it's a big sphere, a ball, and then a staircase that goes up with a door. And so you open the door, you bury it in the ground, and then you just walk down. You can put these in people's backyards, you can put them on your farms, and it's about 20 refrigerators uh, is what it holds with okay. shelving. You could take a 20 foot sea can and do it that way. I know the Amish and Mennonite farmers I've been working with for you know like 13 of my 20 years of farming, they will have an above ground pool where they score ice. So when we get those negative 10, 20 snaps in the winter and they have a trap door on the side of the pool, they score the ice, meaning cut big giant blocks, like uh, kind of the size of a minivan. And then they stick hooks on it, slide it out because ice slides nice onto a little trailer. They take the horse carriage into the barn and then they slide that block off into the ground at like uh, three or four feet and they insulate it with hay. And that is their cold storage. So they have like a big room where they drop that hay down or the this ice down, insulate it. And then right up until uh, kind of the mid to late August, they have a nice cold space. And then that ice has, that thermal mass has melted. 
And that's the way they've done it. And why we can't be still doing that en masse at all their firms is beyond me. Uh, another amazing solution, and it's the easiest thing ever. And, uh, you know, it, it comes down to these building codes and stuff like that. And uh, we just have to get in ingenuitive and, and do things. But um, a lot of the uh, tire houses or earth ships that are insulated and keep a, a 72 degree Fahrenheit all year round without the aid of a furnace. I mean, that's one thing, alternative housing. Um, and better insulated housing. But if you take a pipe and you run it four feet down and then you run it, I think it was 25 feet. Don't quote me on that, but about 25 feet away from your house. So you take a pipe, it goes down the ground four feet, and then it runs this way 25 feet into the back wall of your basement. Mm -hmm. And you obviously have a little cap so water can't get in it, mice, bugs, all that kind of stuff, mesh. And then that little door where that pipe is connected to your basement when you open that it creates a draft so if it's 30 degrees celsius 40 degrees celsius outside by the time that hot air goes down four feet and then travels 25 feet 30 feet this way into your house that air is now like eight degrees celsius or cooler um or 10 degrees but point being now you have air conditioning coming into your house free just from mm -hmm. the thermal mass of the earth there is so many technologies. There's so many easy ways to cool ourselves instead of wasting our hydro at peak hours on air conditioning. It's absolutely insane how we as people haven't just figured these things out and done them. Um, freezing water bottles and attaching them to the back of a fan. Another good way. You're running your freezer all year round. Why not put some frozen water bottles or whatever and zip tie them to the back of your fans and move them around? And then when they melt, you put them back in the freezer and you cycle out your next four. That's what I'm doing with coolers right now in the absence of a big uh, storage facility. But we're getting one of these spheres. And if people want to send me their emails and their numbers, we're going to be bulk purchasing a lot of things uh, in the next couple of years that we can probably get cheaper. So one being that those uh, in-ground root cellar kind of things, people also bury shipping containers in the ground. Um, is another great way. Low flush toilets, composting toilets, all these things that are going to help us save on water. Um, and other things that I, I think of that are just absolutely integral, like we had hemp stolen from us uh, 80, 100 years ago for political reasons. Hemp, you can make everything. If we are going to rely on government or uh, business as an answer for anything, we need to start absolutely harassing them about opening up all these old technologies that we know we had. Like they took the thrashing equipment that we were making paper from uh, and the, uh, the hemp and they just destroyed it and made all our paper out of our forests and pulp and paper because of political interest. But we had all this technology. We need to get back mm -hmm. to there. There's hemp is a good building solution which uh, is way stronger than concrete. It's uh, more insulative than concrete. Aircrete is another thing people can look into. And, and really quickly, it's like a PVC tube. You stuff a bunch of steel wool inside there and you get a fire extinguisher. You put soap and you put water in it and you force the soap and water through that uh, five inches, six inches of PVC tube with all those steel wool. And it micronizes the bubbles like shaving cream. And then you can mix your concrete and water with this shaving cream and then it makes these cinder blocks that are like 10 times stronger than concrete you can throw them they float in water but they're super strong and super insulative and you can build with those but these are all things that are kind of illegal they're not up to code even though there's no reason they're stronger we can do all these things it's it, it's and you and i know everybody that's out there you you know about diy things you know about different technologies that have been kind of taken from us and, and not not allowed because of money and greed and mm. corporate interest and all that kind of stuff. Um, anyways, I'm not going to go down that road, but there's a lot of different building things that we need to be putting, uh, say, R60 minimum in our ceilings of our houses so we can conserve mm. heat and we can keep hold in our houses. Um, and or, or if you're building, like right now I'm living in a yurt, I'm off grid. Uh, I'm doing the best that I can. Uh, you know, I got a composting toilet, so 
We're taking buckets of our own poop, composting it properly, sitting it for a couple of years, and then we'll spread it on fruit trees. Uh, once I have it tested, and I mean, I know how to compost. If it sits for three years, there's going to be no problems with it. All the pathogens will be gone. But um, that's another thing. I am buying a lot of things that are useful. So first off, know a local farmer. Um, I'm going to put it to everybody out there. I'm imagining everybody out there is uh, like a normal Canadian, which is not a good thing to be where you get 80% of your produce, meat, and cheese direct from a grocery store, which means you divest all the money out of our economy because it goes to shareholders. If you're investing with a local farmer in your food, in your food supply, your food security, you're going to be encouraging that farmer to keep on farming. Um, I'm just in it for myself these days, and I work down in Hamilton, hopefully uh, teaching anybody that wants to tell them how to grow. Um, but I got out of farming because it's an absolute pitiful way to make a living, uh, 80 hours a week for you know below minimum wage uh, oftentimes. Um, and it's only because of your food choices, our food choices. I still go to the grocery store sometimes too, but uh, I certainly save a lot of food. Um, this is a cedar. Uh, it is an earthway cedar. I'm going to put the, that down so I can show you properly. Um, this is about $130. It makes seeding really easy. Um, it's got plates in it. It has a, a little mechanism down here, an anchor. I hope you can see that to drop the seeds and cover them. It's a little wasteful. It's, it drops way too many seeds. Um, so if you've been farming as long as I have and you know things, and uh, I have this saying that I'm too poor to buy cheap. So this is about double the price. This is a Jang cedar. It's from Korea. There's the hopper. It has little brushes inside. I can't really show you that take, uh, it, it brushes all the excess seed off so you get one 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 seed dropping and you can put different gears in it so that it will drop every one inch two inch three inch four inch so you're not wasting seed another great investment um here's another one uh and i mean if if we have a list together and people are looking at any of these things and wanting to buy them uh we can probably get them at a, at a better price but here's another amazing implement the grim reaper a scythe and I mean, th these are the things like in the absence of uh, petrol or in the absence of having uh, our power cut, uh, what are we going to be doing? So a scythe is a great way to clean an acre. I can sit there all day and I can scythe out an acre myself. Um, it's not that hard, but all these kinds of hand tools, like I've been buying saws, um, hand powered drills that you... I mean, it's just leaning on something and turning and it goes right through the wood super quick. Um, all these kinds of things and encouraging companies um, by getting them to make them because a lot of it is old antique stuff that, you know, is, is completely gonna, practical. Yeah. Do we need a lending library? Do we need like a, a tool sharing system where we buy one, but we know it's available to borrow and do those tasks that you need? Because I don't need a a hand drill 365 days of the year, but it's nice to know that when I do need it, there's one available. And are you gonna be building all the time? Yeah, like, I mean, even as a farmer, it's nice for me to have it around, but um, if we're all courteous and responsible, then hey, have it for two days and get it back to the library or the person that has it. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, to, to me, it's crazy that everybody on the block owns their own lawnmower. Like, why wouldn't yes. it be every three, four families and then you all chip in when it needs to be fixed because they all break down? Yep. Um, My in-laws yep. used to do that with the uh, the snowblower because you don't need a snowblower all winter, but you just need it for those mornings when uh, you get a heavy snow. And so let's share one. So on that note, here is a, this is a BCS. It is a gas powered machine. Um, anything that is diesel powered is going to be better in the future because you can at least make your own oils and then run uh, diesel engines. Um, I have a compost spreader here that is that attaches to that. It's ground driven. That is a beautiful thing. So ground driven meaning when it pulls across the ground and those wheels turn, the walking floor gets engaged and it drops the compost. Anything that's ground driven is great. 
um, all these kinds of like um, a blender that has a handle that goes in one bit of gears and then underneath it, it has another one that goes in another bit of gears and you control the speed with how fast you turn. So the top one is the low, it doesn't spin very fast. And then when you put it in the bottom one, when you spin it like this, it makes the thing go um, Hand grinders, I grind my own coffee by hand as well. We've got a, a, um, a stone mill grinder that's a hand crank. Um, a lot of stuff in outdoor stores, when you're going backcountry camping, there's a lot of those kinds of things that mm. we can also use. And, um, you know, solar ovens. Who in their right mind wants to cook in an oven in the middle of summer when you've got sun outside and you can make a solar oven? Like, check out DIY solar ovens, and then you're saving on energy. You're not cooking yourself in your house, and your air conditioner is fighting against your... I mean, there's a lot of little things that we can do to really... Uh, minimize our hydro um, any horse drawn equipment that you can find out there too is going to be a valuable way like if the fit hits the shan and we got to start bartering things and you have a piece of like a lot of people just have these horse drawn equipment as lawn ornaments um, mm -hmm. if you have access to these things and fix them up what an amazing thing to barter with when if things get a little scarce like we need a good amount of scarcity to shake things up so that people actually understand what is uh, what is important. I mean, COVID kind of taught us some of these things, but because we've been so comfortable for so long, we really have no idea um, how to survive. Um, and so these are the things we should be thinking about. Another like water catchment, like when I was in Australia where water is a lot more scarce, every single house has an eaves trough attached to a water tank and pretty much yeah. every single house is not sucking municipal water. They're sucking out of there and then they freeze or they boil the water to kill the mosquitoes or you just have some filtration. Like mm -hmm. I, I just recently bought a Berkey's uh, water filter. It's uh, They're about $630 now, but they've got two um, carbon uh, filters on it. And I mean, you can suck right out of a dirty puddle and uh, drink the water. And uh, that's a really valuable thing to have too, and buy a bunch of uh, carbon filters so you have them for, you know, set yourself up for five years and it ends up being very inexpensive. If you're buying in water because you don't like your city water, that's, you'll make your money back in like a year or two uh, by having one of these filters. Yeah. Um, and again, when you're talking rain catchment systems, you're not talking about the residential rain barrels that you get at the municipal sales or the Canadian Tire. You're talking like the rain hog catchment systems. Which, thousand liter coats. Yeah, and I have tried to find a local supplier. There used to be one in Brantford. I don't think they're there anymore. So, you know, we're, we're looking at shipping things from Vancouver, which doesn't make a lot of sense. We're getting more and more rain in shorter periods of time we need to be able to capture that and let it slowly uh, go back into the into the ground where it can absorb slowly and you know save some for watering our household plants and on our residential properties. So yeah, rain catchment is going to be a very important thing that we all need to figure out to prevent and this like, thing. <laughs> one of the most beautiful things that in the world is just absolute magic like there's a movie called waking life and there's all kinds of amazing quotes in that but the ongoing wow is happening now every day i put seeds in water and boop, it germinates that is absolute magic i put vegetables and sink it into a saltwater brine and put it under water and the yeast from the air collects and it starts the lacto fermentation that makes vegetables break down more easily digestible that's magic. It happens every day for free. There's something called the schmutz deck and biosand filters. So when there's giant hurricanes that come in and wipe out all the water supply systems and all that in countries, and I mean, it can happen in Canada, you know, we're one forest fire, hurricane, flood away from having complete uh, scarcity of food and, and water and all that. And there's these things called biosand filter and really quick, it's like big chunks of rock at the bottom or broken pieces of pottery, followed by smaller rocks for about say a, a quarter of a, of a, if you picture like a normal blue barrel, rain barrel that people have. And then the next three quarters almost is just filled with sand. 
And at mm -hmm. the top, at the bottom, you got a spigot. At the top, you have water flowing in. And uh, after about two weeks, the schmutz deck forms. And the schmutz deck is a bacterial mass that forms. That's the beginnings of the filtration. So if you got poopy pee, gross water, it goes in the top. It hits that schmutz deck. It takes a bunch of the pathogens out. And then by the time it goes through all that sand and those rocks at the bottom and comes out the spout, equal flow at top, equal flow at bottom, that schmutz deck and all that, the water coming out of there is pure. And I mean, these are things that are just absolutely free and is like, it's so easy to do. You just do it exactly like I just said. And then it just happens magically two weeks if you got a water flow. So if you have your totes from your house and you're uh, like, you got a bunch of crap coming out of your shingles and all that toxic stuff. I mean, if you can get tin and metal roofs, go for it. Uh, a sheet of tin right now is going for 16 something for a four by eight. So, I mean, there you can price that out. Um, all these things I've been thinking of, but it will take all the garbage out of your shingles and that, and that schmutz deck. Mm -hmm. And if you got your uh, water up on uh, some skids or whatever, then you're ready to go. You could do it right into a tote, into a tote, into a tote. Um, other easy things. I've seen um, those, uh, I've seen those as uh, water filtration solutions for Africa. Um, so if they can design it for there, why aren't we implementing and using more of that? It's not even technology. It's just sharing a knowledge system of how to filter water. Yeah. I mean, it's low tech, really. It's low like tech. low to no yeah. tech. Like it's, it's amazing. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm saving cause these things are just throw away. Like people get these planters. I have literally about 6,000 of these things because I've been saving them and then stockpiling them a bit. Because, I mean, well, I'm a farmer, so, you know, I, we go through about 30, 40,000 seedlings a year. So I'm always going to use them. Um, a few other things I wanted to cover quick um, as good things to buy is um, stainless steel sinks for washing vegetables. There's a lot of throwaway of those. We just got a big, mm -hmm. uh, like, a 12-footer on the free to the side of the road. Scrub brush made it nice and clean. It's stainless steel. It's great. Foot powered sewing machines, like remember those little treadles you used to go Trundle, and you just yeah, tap it. Yeah. So you can find anything that you don't have to plug in, from yeah. building building utensils to sewing is going to be huge. Like who's going to make shoes if the fit hits the shan? I keep saying that, but <laughs> who's going to make shoes? Does anybody have the skills out there? These are the skills that are going to be these intrinsic things that are completely not valued right now in any monetary way, but. You know, if you need to darn your socks, are you going to be able to darn your socks? Uh, all these kinds of workshops and stuff. Um, one of the biggest things is right here. This is the Rodales, all new Organic Encyclopedia, all new 20 years ago. It doesn't change. This is organic gardening at its finest, having hard copies of stuff. I mean, we're at a point, and I'm not trying to scare people. It's just more of a reality check, but... Most of our seed vegetables, like well over 80% of our seed vegetables comes from Europe and Asia. And if we have scarcity ever, we've got a war in the Ukraine right now. They're a massive agricultural powerhouse for wheat, everything else. But if we have wars and we have scarcity, where, what country in their right mind is going to let go of their seed and send it to Canada when they have their own peoples and own needs to... And right now, like I'm saving as much seed as I can. It's up to the backyard gardeners, to grandmother, to grandfather, varieties of seeds that do well here, that are tasty, that yield well, that um, taste is often indicative of mineral density too. If you have good uh, flavored vegetables, then oftentimes that's going to be uh, indicative of having mineral density. So we need to get our biology back in our soil for that. But saving seeds, if you can save even a few varieties a year, then again, you have something to barter now um, and get them in your freezer because if you but get it at a negative. Yeah, yeah, but do we need to teach people how to save seed? Is Absolutely. that part of the learning curve that needs to be reintroduced back into society? I mean, when everybody was a farmer, you knew how to save your seed, but that's not our lifestyle anymore. We go to the grocery store. We don't grow our own food. Do people still know how to grow their or save their own seeds? So we're going to be doing more workshops. I'm sure you're going to be doing more workshops and it's just letting people know that, yeah, this is something that we are more than happy to share what knowledge we have 
if anybody wants to learn alongside us. Yeah, get us your uh, email so we can, one, get our reach bigger, we can build more momentum and grow community. And uh, if you like identifying problems and then a solution is presented and uh, you don't have time to do it, make time. You know, your cousin's three-year-old's birthday party in the backyard for a barbecue is less important than you learning how to save seed or you being a part of your local food system. And then you can, in part, give them the gift that you receive from somebody else. And uh, I mean, we're going to be doing workshops and stuff like that all season long. Every Saturday, we have a barbecue out here on our farm. I'm trying to create the community, um, but I'm having a hard time getting people out. And so I kind of know what's out there. Spread the word. Kevin, what's your email? Uh, my email is K H A M K Ham, like my yep. last name, 27 at gmail.com. Um, I am not a super tech guy, but I do get back to people within uh, like 48 business hours. <laughs> 48 <laughs> but, days. Uh, yeah. 48, yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty good. I check it three times because I, I yeah, I'm pretty low tech. So that's my the way of getting a hold of me. But yeah, we need people yeah. to get involved and that's the biggest way. Money is one thing, your sweat equity is another and that's where the real value is. Absolutely. And, you know, follow us on social media, stay in touch with us on our websites when we post information, get involved. Even if you can't join in, let let a friend know, let somebody know that at least this work is happening in the community. We want to teach people that whole food system cycle, how to grow their food, how to can and preserve it, how to save the seeds and make sure that our community uh, continues to be resilient in an ever changing world. Every Tuesdays and Thursdays from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. If you look, go to McQuest and Urban Farm um, and let us know you're coming and fill out a simple volunteer sheet. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, fertile gate, like being able to fertilize through irrigation. Uh, really simple ways of just chopping up, macerating your weeds and extruding the juices from them that are all minerally dense and water soluble. So mm -hmm. it's low tech. It's beautiful. Yep. Fantastic. Looking forward to uh, continuing these conversations happening every Tuesday um, at 12. Join in, send us comments, questions, topics, suggestions, and uh, thanks for joining in. Thanks for your time, Kevin. No worries. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. <laughs>